So, hello again, now in a different guise, uh, as, a, as one of the presenters of what is a, as actually a multiple institution and multiple country team um, trying to unravel the mysteries of all these exciting finds that um, have been found in the, in the basements of various museums um, across Ukraine by Marina, actually. Um, we've heard a lot about Herodotus in the last few days, and we are starting with Herodotus as well. Um, Herodotus, often regarded as the father of history, sometimes called father of lies, reported upon some remarkable stories, and the more exotic of these serve to undermine his role as a historian. However, many of his reports seem to be rooted in fact, and throughout this conference we have seen several instances of archaeology confirming his sometimes incredible claims. One such tale is of Scythian archers flaying the right arm of their dead enemies and making of the skin a covering for their quivers. And I will not quote all of the uh, passage, but the, the relevant one is highlighted in red. So other Scythians flay the right arms of their dead enemies and make of the skin which is stripped off with the nails hanging to it a covering for their quivers. As already detailed in the preceding presentation by Marina Daragan, almost every Scythian burial is accompanied by a quiver set, although usually only arrowheads survive. The number of arrows in archers sets varied, as we've heard, uh, and could reach up to 200 arrows and more. The quiver fulfilled a very important function in the outfit of the Scythian archer, as we have demonstrated just half an hour earlier. Its design had to provide proper storing and transporting of a large number of arrows, but the quiver also served as a status and ethnicity indicator of the owner. The terms quiver and goritos are often used interchangeably for describing the case for arrows. Uh, goritos, however, is a case for storing and transporting not only arrows, but also a bow, whereas a quiver is a case for arrows only, at least the way we understand it at this point. The different terms, Faretra and Goritos, are already encountered in Homer's Odyssey, but are also distinguished by Herodotus. So that's something that um, for our classicist colleagues to tackle possibly in more detail. But how much do we actually know about the construction of Scythian quivers and the materials used to make them? There is substantial iconographic evidence, and of course we've seen these before, uh, correct or not, uh, Greeks certainly associated Scythians with their quivers. Uh, all Scythian archers, or, or what are understood as archers, are uh, depicted carrying one. And of course, Scythians themselves depicted their, themselves um, with uh, quivers. So these are the stones, some of the stone stelae, as you can see, in every case there is, on the left side, a quiver um, with a bow and uh, likely arrows inside. And there's much more data, of course on the Scythian Torutics. We've seen some of uh, these images throughout the last three days. More direct evidence is provided by the findings of the metal plating of the ceremonial Goritos in the Scythian burials, as in these examples from Ukraine, um, and also even in Macedonian Greece from the so-called tomb of Philip on the bottom left. The example from Sobodeva Magila clearly shows that the metal trappings were attached to organic substrate which has most, uh, mostly disintegrated. In contrast to Siberian finds that we have been uh, seeing uh, in the exhibition and also hearing about, in the burials of the Ukrainian Scythia, products made of organic materials are rarely preserved, but occasionally they do survive, even if in fragmentary form. A recent re-examination of quiver sets uh, excavated in southern Ukraine identified numerous preserved examples of leather and wooden parts of quivers. At Bulgakova, for example, the quiver was recovered as a block, so its various components were still in situ and containing arrows when examined. It allows us to reconstruct the basic structural elements of a leather quiver, which in its basic form is a leather case with two compartments and a cover, sewn of durable vegetable tanned leather. It consists of various external, internal, and intermediate parts. The main external parts consist of the front and back walls, the base of the quiver, the reinforcing plates of its lateral wall and base, and also the cover. The walls of the quiver are designed differently. The front wall is simple and usually consists of one piece of leather. The back wall is composite and is made up by various decorative elements. 
The connection between the front and back walls is reinforced by a plate and forms the base of the quiver. The interior is characterized by a partition wall. Understanding of the construction allows visualizing one of the other uh, more complete quivers found at Ilyinka, which was recovered in fragments, unfortunately, so it, uh, it was a bit of a uh, giant puzzle to try to put it back together. Note that some of the pieces preserved, um, preserved decorative patterns and red paint, and the analysis of paint will be presented in the following section indicating that leather quivers could be lavishly ornamented even without the addition of the gold elements. The rest of the finds unfortunately survive as fragments, sometimes identifiable as specific parts, for example the bases, as you can see in this case and in this case, uh, but usually too fragmented to identify which structural element they belong to. The documentation was frequently insufficient to provide a detailed contextual analysis either. However, the finds provided an opportunity to try and identify the animal species used to create these leather artifacts and to test if there was any truth to Herodotus' claim. Until recently, species identification of archaeological skin was primarily performed by light and scanning electron microscopy or the analysis of ancient DNA. Skins with a preserved pellage are usually subjected to identification via either mac macroscopic inspection or by using light and electron microscopy to investigate the hair follicle pattern known as the grain pattern or, and, hair morphology when hair actually survives. Despite being widely applied, the reliability of species identification based on the light and electron microscopic observation of skin and hair morphology is problematic both due to biological variation within species, similarities between species, and degradation problems. Four samples um, of the quivers that we uh, have been looking at were subjected to counter electrophoresis, which tests for presence of blood, sweat, and saliva, a forensic method previously applied to leather samples from Yakovlevsky, Yakovlevsky burial II in Russia, on the basis of which human tissue was identified in several fragments none of our samples produced any results. <laughs> our attempts to use macroscopic methods to identify species of the Scythian leather samples have not been successful either. All of the fragments lack pellage and their surfaces have been completely degraded, likely due to scraping and tanning of the skins during their preparation, use, as well as post-depositional processes. As you can see from these SEM micrographs, no diagnostic features could be recovered from the leather fragments as no epidermal tissues could be observed with only the corium visible, that is the, the, the um, next layer under the, the, the surface of the skin. Although some skins preserving pellets from contemporary Scythian burials that were used as mirror cases gave positive identification of uh, Mustelidae and Rodentia families. <laughs> Hair morphology was used to identify first species in Scythian period clothing from other burials, for example, in Tuva region. Um, these have been published by Chernova and Busova. In recent decades, new methods based on the analysis of ancient biomolecules have been applied to the species identification of hide and leather. The success of DNA-based approaches, however, depends on DNA preservation, which is conditioned by the diagenetic conditions that the sample experienced during archaeological deposition. This is equally the case for skins that have been subject to tanning processes. More recently, an alternative molecular approach for species identification, adopting mass spectrometry to analyze collagen and keratin residues extracted from small archaeological bone fragments, as well as skin and fur, was developed, called zooms. So, sorry, just so, zooms, which is zoo archaeology by mass spectrometry, is a method of extracting collagen from an organic tissue. Uh, collagen is a structural protein that is found in most human bird or animal um, tissue, uh, and analysing it to make a species ID, much like a DNA analysis. Uh, collagen is one of the most abundant proteins in skin, uh, and so far it doesn't seem to be damaged uh, by the tanning process, so we're able to make some uh, identifications. So, uh, the process uh, is as follows. So for each sample of leather, a small approximately one millimeter square fragment uh, was taken from each of the fragments provided um, and placed in the sample tube. We then uh, 
then washed it each sample with uh, the alkali sodium hydroxide. This is to remove any um, light absorbing contaminants because our analytical technique involves using lasers. Uh, and that can sort of uh, basically make the uh, spectrum black. <laughs> um, then after that, we washed them a further three times with a ammonium bicarbonate buffer. Uh, this is just to bring the pH of the sample back to a uh, neutral pH. Uh, and then collagen was then disluted by soaking each sample in 50 microliters of the ambit. And we added a, um, a digestive enzyme called trypsin. Uh, we then incubated each of these samples at 37 degrees centigrade overnight. Uh, so during this process, this overnight process, uh, that allowed the collagen that's in the leather to uh, dissolute out of the leather into solution, and then the trypsin digests the collagen at specific points. Uh, these are points that we know because uh, trypsin will only cut uh, between certain parts of uh, protein chains. So the digested fragments are then extracted from the solution using a filter tip which then purifies the sample for analysis. Uh, this solution is boxed onto a target peg, which I uh, proves diagram there. It's basically a washing metal plate, um, and uh, analyzed with Molditoff AMX. Uh, that's basically a big box. <laughs> you put these samples in one end, uh, you get a laser pad at the samples. They fly down a, uh, basically a long time of flight tube, uh, and are separated by mass. Um, the spectra produced at the end, an example of which we've got here, uh, shows the masses of these protein fragments that have been produced by the trips of digestion. Uh, and then we can compare this to our database. We've got over 100 species in our database uh, of these known masses uh, and to make these species IDs. Uh, it is worth noting that this is a destructive method, uh, but as I said earlier, it's a tiny amount of uh, material that's actually needed to get uh, results. So, uh, material analyzed included 38 samples from 11 burials. Some of the objects, uh, there were multiple samples of, so uh, of the different fragments that were found in the same quivers, uh, in order to ascertain whether there were different species present in these quivers, or whether in order to um, account for any parts of the quivers not uh, surviving as well as other parts. Uh, in addition to the quivers, a fragment described as part of trousers and a fragment, part, a fragment of a leather vessel were also tested. So in terms of results, we made a positive identification for 21 or 55% of the uh, spirit, of the um, fragments that were analysed. In the case of multiple, uh, multiple fragments, uh, there were some that could produce uh, identifi uh, sorry, identifiable results, but we were able to make uh, identifications on the other fragments in those bodies. The species identified are mostly domesticates, with more than half of the identified species either being goat with nine identifications or sheep with six. Uh, there is also one example of cattle, and a further three from either the Bovidae or Servidae families, though due to the poor quality preservation, you can't actually make a more um, exact distinction, unfortunately. The final two uh, identifications stick out. So we've got one which is some sort of wild carnival. We, um, due to similarities in collagen, um, in collagen sequences, we were not able to make an exact identification. However, we were able to exclude bear wolf or lynx. And of particular interest, we actually found one human uh, from Ilyinka, Kurgan 2, Burial 4. Now, unfortunately, the fragmentary nature of the material and the lack of precise documentation of the excavations that took place several decades ago make it difficult to contextualize this intrigue and find more. But it may be worthwhile to test other finds, particularlyly the leather from Yakov Levsky, I'm sorry if I botched that, uh, burial 2 in Russia, which was identified as human by cancer immunoelectrophoresis. Curiously, while several of the tested fragments from the most complete were found at Bolgakovo, or Bolgakov, Bolgakov, uh, all returned the same species, goat, the quivers from Ilyenka and Akhov, 
uh, yielded positive identifications of at least three species, suggesting that there was no strict standardization of raw materials for food production. Quivers had a complex structure with multiple elements, this, which could have required uh, different properties, so it would not be unusual to use different types of leather. For example, we can see how the different species correspond to the various quiver fragments at Elunkia Codon 2, uh, Codon 4, Barrier 3. It is notable that most of our leather samples come from domestic species, in contrast to the fur finds in Ukraine and elsewhere, which, which are in the majority derived from wild animals. Does this mean that leather samples may have been produced by settled craftspeople within uh, the Scythian sphere of interaction, since leather has a longer production time? Um, this is a question we have yet to answer. In favour of this hypothesis is the style of the decoration on the fragments from Yelinka, which have a distinctively Hellenic style. And since the Scythians of southern Ukraine had lots of materials to rivetize through exchange of the, with the uh, Pontic Greeks, there is a possibility that some of the quivers, as have been argued by uh, for sorry, have, as have been argued for much of the Turetic art, uh, were produced in Greek settlements. Yet the prevalence of sheep and goat is not surprising, since these animals, as we've heard from other presentations, were the main staple domestic species of the Scythians. And nomads have always been known ethnographically to make skins from leather, uh, to make skins of leather. So conclusions. Uh, presumes to prove particularly useful in this investigation, providing species identification, where um, visual-based analysis was enabled to due to the removal of the pelage during the leather production and severe degradation of the artifacts. We have also been able to identify a wide range of species from domesticates um, and also pick out human dry skin where it was unexpected. As in other example, uh, no, uh, sorry, as in other instances, Herodotus uh, appears to have been at least somewhat correct. Some parts of the, withers, uh, of the quivers were made with human skin. Uh, future work will involve testing to develop a method and to fine tune some of the identifications, and as well to understand the tanning methods. Question: What's the status of the grave from where you have the human Ooh. remains used as? Yeah. Color. <laughs> the textual questions. Yeah, that's something about you. I just wondered, um, is there any 
hints from your results so far that there is different leather processing for different species. I was thinking particularly about the decorated leathers compared to the non-decorated, or colour, things that might be obvious at this stage, and, um, and also the carnivore as well, where maybe you'd be more likely to have prefer. Um, so the tanning is potentially something that we'll be looking at um, collaborating with uh, another researcher about. So this is something that we've not really had a chance to look into yet, um, but we'll be in the future on the radio. Well, surprisingly, the, the fragments that have clear traces of paint, uh, that we'll talk about a bit later, about um, half of the samples from that uh, quiver, and we had seven, I believe, uh, gave positive results. That was the Ilinka burial. Whereas some of the others that obviously don't have anything on them did not give any results. So there is, doesn't seem to be a correlation uh, at this point that we can see. But of course, we're ve this is very preliminary. Uh, you know, some of the results came in literally a couple of weeks ago. It was still running. Uh, so this is all very, very fresh, and we need to kind of now stand back and sort of regroup and uh, make a plan uh, in a way what next, what is the next stage to understand this. But I understand there's already some interesting also results in terms of degradation of the proteins that um, people who understand about that stuff uh, find it very intriguing as well. <laughs>